Hi, this is John Forslund, TV voice of the Carolina Hurricanes. You're watching the Power Play Break, the place to talk about pucks. Back here in the Power Play Break, Chris Riley along with John Forslund, voice of the Hurricanes. John, let's talk about now. You're with the Indians. How does the opportunity to come along to go to the Hartford Whalers? Right, after numerous opportunities, or at least um, looking at different opportunities for jobs and not getting them, um, in 1991, we finished our second year as a Calder Cup champion back-to-back, -back, but with different affiliates. 89-90 team was an Islander team. And then the owner changed affiliates out of that, and the Islander players went to Troy in Capital District, played there, and we inherited the Binghamton Whalers, who set a futility record. I believe they only had 12 wins a season before. Okay, so now we had the Calder Cup, defending Calder Cup champions, marketed as the, the Binghamton Whalers or the Binghamton Whalers players. So we had the same coach, Jimmy Roberts, and they had the best overall record in the league that year and won the Calder Cup and, and going away, really. They were, nobody could touch them. So Jimmy got the Hartford job the next year, 91-92, and they were looking for someone to fit, fill a role in the hockey department. Uh, the public relations guy, they wanted him to concentrate on business and the marketing aspect of the operation. They wanted a hockey communications guy to work with Chuck Caton on radio. And so that's initially how I was going there. Yeah. Well, the PR director decided to quit at the draft that year in Buffalo, threw a fit about what was happening. <laughs> he quit, and now the PR job was open. So they came to me and said, we, can you do this, and you'll, we'll pay you this. And it was far more than they were initially going to pay me. And after seven years... In the American League, uh, I needed probably, you felt like money. a millionaire. <laughs> I needed a real job. Yeah. You know, my wife had worked full time. She carried the insurance benefits, and I was chasing this dream. So I needed that from a realistic standpoint. So I took it. But I always told everybody I want to become a broadcaster. That's why I'm I'm doing this a short term. So I did that, and then ownership changed. Mr. Carmanis bought the team. They had me in the office. They said they wanted me to continue as PR. And I said, I'm really not interested in this. I'll do it to get you started, because I knew the ropes. They didn't have a lot of experience with NHL people, but I really want to become a broadcaster. So a couple years later, they made a change and gave me Rick my Rick Peckham my was job. there at that time, yes. and, and then Rick left to go take the Tampa job. Right, and what happened was Sports Channel had the announcers, and they were paid by Sports Channel at the time. The Whalers wanted to pay their broadcasters, which they do now. And because of that, they had me do the over-the-air package in the lockout season of 94-95, which was supposed to be 15 games because of the 48 games got trimmed down to one. <laughs> and I did the game with Emil Francis as my color man in Madison Square Garden. That was my first game in 1995. Not a bad place to get introduced no. to it, huh? And then, you know, one thing led to another. They made the change. And then Daryl Ray and I, 95-96, that was my first year as a TV guy. Now, were you excited about this? Were you saying, oh, finally, I've, I've come yeah. to that point in my career. Yeah. You, know, you paid your dues like most of the people yeah. have to do. And, it was um, a long time. It, wa it wasn't most the most direct path, but it finally happened. And Daryl and I had a history of being friends. And he had played in Springfield when I worked there, so I knew him. And uh, we were both young. We are both the same age. We are both starting this together. We had a great first year. And then Ken Hitchcock got the job in Dallas. He had coached Razor junior hockey and Kamloops and enticed him to go to Dallas, which was a great move for him. Yeah. And I stayed and I never left. Now, Hartford is, you know, they, they, Kevin Paul DuPont from the Boston Globe called them Forever 500s. Yeah. But a lot of people out there have an affinity for the Whalers. Yeah. What do you, what do you think that is? Why do you think that well, is? Well, I think you look at the teams they had. For many years, they were just in the wrong division. For many years, they were in the Adams division. You had the Canadians, you had the Bruins. Oh, I, right. Had really tough teams. Right, and I remember in, in 1990, they finished fourth in the Adams division, but they had the seventh best overall record. So, you know, they had great teams, but because of their lack of playoff success, everybody got nervous, and they made decisions. Coaches were let go. Ron Francis was traded, yeah, you know? I, I mean, it was... decisions were made because they didn't realize and the pressure of the fans and everything, but they didn't realize how good they were. It wasn't, they were in the wrong neighborhood. So it wasn't good enough. And so you make decisions and you blow up a team. And then what do you have left? And then you have years of, you know, pain. Yes. And I got to Hartford, Riles, the, the, um, the first year after Ronnie was traded. And the season ticket base went from 11-5 to 6. 
And every day there was just a plethora of phone calls coming in, people complaining about the trade, and, and we had to repair that. It was impossible. It was impossible for the players that were traded to Hartford. It wasn't fair. The whole thing was a mess. You mentioned earlier Gordie Howe, Mr. Yeah. Hockey. Yeah. And you said you, you, you rode with him to the practice rink every day. What was that like? Oh. You know, it's, it's like, you know, I, I say to people, when you meet him for the first time, it's like, you look at him and say, it's like the guy in the dollar bill. Yeah. You know, it's like looking at George Washington yeah, he, for our he, sport. He would talk about how the game is played. He would talk about what Bobby Holik was doing wrong with his hands and how he could improve that if somebody would just ask him, which I'm not sure they ever did. Um, he would talk about the old days and what happened with his contracts and the coaches he had. And, um, yeah, Jack it, Adams was really difficult in Detroit. I mean. And he was just a good, he, Gordy was just a good man that went to the office and they gave him the contract and he said, yeah, thank you, I'll sign. And he never hey. never pushed the envelope, which led to Ted Lindsay and the union and all of that. And yeah. Gordy was that other guy that was, you know, behind the team all the time. So he was, that was a, that was a highlight for me. And, and, you know, Bobby Orr was on our board of directors too. Mm -hmm. And our, our owner at the time, Richard Gordon, had a board of people outside the organization that called an advisory board. And Yvonne Lendl and Roger Staubach and I Jim remember, Calhoun, remember, they were all on this board. <laughs> but Bobby Orr was on the board. And really, you know, again, that goal he scored against St. Louis was like my, my shining moment as a little boy. That's when I really got the, the itch to do what I do. But years later, Bobby Orr was behind the scenes working to get me my first position with, with the Whalers, which I'll never forget. Now, did you get a chance to talk to him much or get to know him I, as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see him a great deal and uh, first class all the way and doing great with his agency now and, and all that, but just uh, he's the greatest as far as I'm concerned. Now, Mark Howe and Marty Howe yeah. played also with the Whalers, and Gordy was there at the end of his career. That had to be for Gordy, very exciting to be able to have started in Houston and to wind up in Hartford and yeah. with his boys. And well, he, was, he was really proud of his boys, all of them, and, and certainly the ones that played hockey. Um, he was very proud of their each individual story. I worked as a broadcaster with Marty because Marty did radio with Chuck Caton in that one year with uh, when Daryl Ray and I were doing television, the four of us, we were the four announcers. That was, that was a lot of fun. Got to know the family and they're a really close knit group. What's the best piece of advice Gordy ever gave you? Did he ever give you any tidbit, any, anything at all, hockey-wise, to say, hey, you know, here's something I always want to hear, or, you know, or he just... You know what, he, he said this to Chuck, and, and, and Chuck has said it, and, and I remember him saying it to me, it was just, you know, keep your eyes and your ears open all the time. And I've never forgotten that, because you can be in a locker room, you don't necessarily have to be asking that golden question, but you can be in there and hear something, and know your place on the bus, know where you're supposed to sit. What I mean by that is know your role within the team and you won't get hurt. Don't think you're bigger than what's going on and keep your ears open all the time. He told me that and that was probably great advice. When we get back, we're gonna talk about the day that broke Hartford's heart when the Whalers were gonna be leaving to go to Carolina mm -hmm. right after this.